Welcome to the South London Makerspace Mini CNC Induction. We're going to start off with the risk assessment. So go to the tools page on Discourse. So to get there, go to the main tools category. At the top pinned is a list of tools in the space. Click on the list of tools in the space. You can go down to the messy room, which is where it's currently located. And you'll see two things in here. One is the CAD CAM PC. So that's the machine I'm using right here, which is the design and manufacturing um, PC, which is basically where you build your design, generate the G code. And then if you go over here, this is the mini CNC and this is running Linux CNC. So Linux CNC, this PC is dedicated to just controlling this machine. So it sends real time commands to the mini CNC to actually make the moves and, and uh, control uh, the, the CNC process. Um, so it's a two-step process. You need to design over here and then bring your code over here and run it on the machine. So you can't do any design over here. If you need to make changes to your design, uh, you'll do that on the CAD CAM PC. So back over here, let's start with uh, going through the risk assessment for the machine itself. So there's a tool page for every tool in the shop. Um, so here we have the mini CNC machine, which is an iCell CPM 2018. So as, as I noted here, you have to go through the induction uh, before you can use the machine. And then also this machine obviously shouldn't be left unattended while, while uh, during operation because something could go wrong at any point in the, in the cut. Um, so don't leave it unattended and always be ready to hit the e-stop. So this is a small-ish machine. Uh, the movement areas are 200 by 175 by 90. So 200 X. 175Y, 90Z, uh, and the clamping table is larger, as you can see over here. So the clamping table has more space than that. So the clamping table is 250 by 425. So you can fit bigger workpiece than you can actually cut the entire thing. So it's suitable for milling, boring, cutting, engraving, proportioning. Um, essentially, it's a subtractive uh, manufacturing process. So it's the opposite of a 3D printer. You're not taking material and building up what you're trying to build. You're going to take a block of whatever material you want to use, so your stock, and you're going to subtract and mill away, take away material until you have your final design. In this induction, we're going to cover the risk assessment and safety of the machine, a brief introduction, introduction into milling, uh, we're going to cover the coordinate system, so kind of how uh, the machine looks at the world and how it knows where it is in space as it's, as it's doing your job. Um, work holding devices, uh, the tools that you might use, different types of cutting. Uh, basic use of a package called VCarve Pro, which is where you'll do your design and generate your tool paths, which then the machine can use to actually uh, cut your stock. Um, we'll give an overview of the machine itself, so the ISOL CPM 2018. We'll show you how to load G-code from the CAD CAM PC and put it onto Linux uh, CNC and actually run your job. Um, we'll show homing the machine, which is basically um, initializing it and setting the initial coordinates so that it knows where it is in space. We'll show how, how to secure stock down to the CNC bed so it doesn't come loose and move while your, while your uh, operation is going. We'll show you how to attach the collet to the uh, spindle. So this is what actually holds the tooling into the, into the, into the spindle that turns. And so I'll show you that. These are the different bits. So various set of different bits. We'll uh, explain the differences between these and when to use which. And then, we will, and then we'll touch off the axes and um, run your code and then show you how to clean up and leave it clean for the next person. Okay, so first let's start with the risk assessment. So the risk assessment is linked off of the tool page on a separate page. So you can click on that and go through here and see uh, the different risks for this machine. So in general, because it's enclosed in a cabinet, there's, there's very few risks to the user. So sharp moving cutting tools, obviously you could cut yourself while you're trying to load the tooling or if you open it really fast and stick your hand in there, you could cut yourself, but it's fairly unlikely. The machine is set up and we'll show you in a, in a bit, we'll show you the safety mechanisms, but it's set up so that there's no way to have the machine running while the, the door is open. It will only operate when the door is closed. Um, you could get splinters or small cuts uh, from the material after you've cut it. Um, so that's something to be careful of. So that's a medium risk. 
fire is a risk because you're obviously you could have um, heat buildup from incorrect speeds and feeds and we'll cover those uh, in kind of a, at a high level. There's a very low risk of entrapment in moving machinery because it is in, in a box. So you, it's very unlikely that you could have it moving while the uh, door is open. Exposure to harm from materials. If you cut a material that's not on the approved list, um, make sure to check with CNC text before you cut anything that's not on the approved list um, because you could generate, yeah, generate um, vapors or dust that's harmful otherwise. So damage to the machine uh, or the tooling are the biggest risks to using the mini CNC. So there's a few major things that can happen. So one is it doesn't know in 3D space exactly where your workpiece is. It doesn't know where the clamps and things are that are holding it. It doesn't even know where the bed is. And so sending it incorrect instruction could cause it to crash into the bed um, and damage either the, the machine itself or the, the tooling. Incorrect feeds and speeds, meaning that how fast the tool is moving through the material as well as how fast it's spinning, um, can cause it to either build up friction, build up heat, and cause uh, smoke or, or a fire. Or if you go too fast, then you could be breaking bits, especially the smaller bits. The other thing that could happen is skipping steps. So occasionally if you end up going into an immovable part of the, of the stock or, or some malfunction, then it could skip a, a step. And so after that, it doesn't know exactly where it left off. The way that the machine works is it sends instructions to the machine to move, say, hey, move one millimeter over here. And it assumes that that actually happens. If for some reason that doesn't happen, then your whole job is off by whatever you know um, whatever error happened in, in the in the in the job. So we're going to have my colleague uh, Kyle give you a little more detail on speeds and feeds. All right. <laughs> to hold tools in the mini CNC, you have to use what are called collets. So these are very precision uh, engineered devices which will hold. Um, individual uh, end mills or uh, bits or different bits um, of an exact diameter. So we've listed uh, what size each collet is, which within a couple hundredths of a millimeter is the exact what you need to use. So we have, for example, a two millimeter or 2.5. If you had a, a 2.3 millimeter, you should of course use the, the, the 2.5 in that case. So it's important that you grab uh, exactly the, the correct collet um, to match the tool, otherwise the collet uh, may break or the tool will not be able to be grabbed effectively. Um, so I demonstrate to you the process of inserting a, a six millimeter tool. I'm going to check and see. I've picked tool 23 here using my handy calipers that it is in fact six millimeter just as the tool chart shows. So using the caliper, I've confirmed that this tool 23, someone has put it back in the wrong, in the correct spot. Uh, and it is in fact six millimeters in diameter. So I will grab the six millimeter collet from the slot. I will check and see, yes, sometimes it's labeled here on its face. Sometimes it's labeled on the body here. It is in fact a six millimeter collet. So the correct order is the collet is inserted into the collet nut and it should pop straight in with a click. And you can see it's seated properly so it can't fall out. Now this collet in the collet nut is inserted into the device, which we'll demonstrate in a moment, and the tool is then inserted second. So it's important to always put the collet nut in first and then um, into the collet nut, insert it all into the spindle, and the tool is the last to be inserted and the first to be pulled back out. So the primary tools that we have uh, for the mini CNC are what's called an end mill and a ball end mill. So an end mill has square corners and a ball mill which has rounded corners. So you can imagine that as you cut a tool path, uh, if you use an end mill that's got these square corners, it'll leave you nice square corners where you have a flat bottom and then vertical sides. Um, and if you use a ball mill, it will leave rounded sides. So the tool paths that we have in VCarve um, have what's called a step over where each tool path goes next to the other, a uh, very, very small with a ball mill, which allows us to do fancy 3D to, uh, curves, which we call 3D contouring, as opposed to uh, an end mill, which has a much more aggressive step over, um, which means that each time the tool cuts, it'll take lots more material, which means it can clear material faster. So as a general rule in the space with the tool paths that we've designed, use an end mill for clearing material or very square sides. And if you want to do 
uh, very um, slower but smoother curves and things like that, you'll choose a ball mill. So and the way to do that, to tell the difference between them, of course, is looking at them. And you can see the square sides here on the end mill or the rounded sides on the ball mill. There's a couple other features of a mill that's worth noting to identify them to make sure they're put away in the wrong, excuse me, in the, in the correct spot. So we, of course, have looked at the shank diameter already, which is uh, the measurement of the shaft using the calipers. Additionally, the primary attribute of an end mill is its cutting diameter. So in some cases, it's the same as the shank, or in other cases, insert shot, it's much, much smaller. And so that's gonna allow us to clear more material in the case of a larger mill, or in the case of a smaller mill, allow us to um, cut much finer detail. Another important aspect for the settings and, and how it gets used is how many flutes um, is on this end mill. And the way to uh, look at that is if you look at the mill, I'm gonna do another insert shot on end, you can see that this particular cutter has four cutting surfaces at the end, which means it's a four flute cutter. So when identifying a mill, um, we can look at the chart and look at different properties and there's other things like the overall length or bits like that, but those are our primary ways of identifying mills. So an important part of machining effectively is choosing the correct feeds and speeds. So speeds are the speed at which the spindle turns in RPM, which is set with manually on our desktop CNC by using a little knob at the top. And the feeds, which are programmed uh, via our G code generator, in this case, feed carve. So the feed is the speed at which the motion platform will move to make that cut. You can imagine as the feed increases, we're able to remove more material. But of course, if you take a too aggressive feed rate, uh, the machine won't be able to cut as quickly. It'll break the bit in some cases or, or cause other issues there. So we have to make sure that we're in this Goldilocks zone of not too fast and not too slow. If you set a too slow feed rate, where the tool will not be cutting material, but in fact be rubbing against it, which uh, both presents a fire risk, as well as increases the temperature of the bit and uh, reduces tool life. So it's important that we choose a correct both speed and feed rate for the material that we're working on. Fortunately, we've chosen appropriate settings in VCARV. So if you stick to those presets for the materials that we've built out the library for, you should be perfectly fine. But as you explore new materials or different settings or bring in your own end mills, for example, um, you'll have to become more aware of how to correctly set those. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is open up VCarve Pro, which is on the desktop of the CAD CAM PC. So VCarve Pro is where we're going to do our design and generate the G code that we're going to run on the mini CNC. So we're going to start by creating a new file. And so this is going to give us this first box here, which is going to be the job setup. And so the First thing I need to do is get a piece of stock. So remember when CNCing, we're milling a uh, material down. And, and so we're taking a piece of, of what we call stock and we're going to take measurements off that. So we're gonna measure the X dimension, which is 89. And we're gonna measure the height, which in my case is 65 and we're going to measure the thickness of the material. So this obviously is very important. Mine's 15. Um, this is very important because obviously if we try to mill down anywhere near the full thickness of the stock, if we had a mismeasurement here, then that could go directly down into the bed of the machine, which would not only damage the machine, but perhaps possibly break something. Uh, there's some other settings here like the Z0 and so this we're going to usually leave at the material surface So this is when we're touching off uh, It's telling it that we're going to touch off on the top of the stock um, And the XY datum position is where we're touching off on the the uh, stock itself so we can set the zero coordinates of the the stock here so typically we choose an outer corner for a rectangle or a square um, shaped material uh, for a circle you might use the middle uh, there's a few uh, other settings here that we don't really need to care about these are more for kind of uh, visualizing what you're going to do so press ok and so now we've basically set up the uh, artboard or the layer here that we can use for our design for the induction we want you to cut 
into your piece of stock. Something very simple, so like your initials, or it could be like your street address, you know, just the numbers, something, something very simple that's gonna actually fit on the material here. Typically, you're gonna want to use uh, if one of the wider fonts. If you use a very narrow font like this, um, the tooling, you'll have a hard time finding tools that fit inside of very narrow letters. And so I'd like to use something like um, Arial Black, which is a pretty wide and thick font, and, and you'll see why in a minute. Um, so here, I'm resizing it kind of fairly large compared to the size of my stock so that I can uh, use this as an example. Um, when it's purple, that means it's selected. So I'm gonna select it, and then I'm gonna use this tool here to align the selected objects. So click on that, and I'm gonna align it to the center of the material. So if you click on this top middle button, that will center it on the material itself. So you can see, I'm gonna close that. Um, so now I have my vector uh, design here that I want to cut. And so I'm gonna go over to the top right and open up this tool paths flyout. And I'm going to click on the pin just to keep it visible. Um, and then you see some parameters here, some toolpath operations. And so toolpath operations are basically telling vCarve what type of uh, motion to generate uh, for the Linux CNC machine to cut. And so here we have an, an option here called profile toolpath, which is essentially gonna follow these vectors, so follow these outside lines. And so there's some various configuration around that. Um, a pocket toolpath is gonna basically remove all the material inside of these, uh, these shapes, so these letters. Uh, there's other various things like drilling and threads and, and various um, fluting and uh, things. So you can look at those up. The two main ones that we're gonna look at and use are the profile toolpath and the pocket toolpath. So for the induction, uh, go ahead and pick pocket toolpath and then remove any tools that are selected there. Um, and so what we want you to do is to design this from scratch and uh, generate the G-code and cut it on the machine as part of the induction. So you can see the start depth. We want to start at the top of the material, so that's zero, zero. Uh, the cut depth is how deep we want to cut. So we could cut something anywhere up to one millimeter. So let's, I'm going to say I'm going to do one millimeter is good. I'm going to select... Uh, the tool that I want to use. So as you're looking at the tool libraries here, you can see the material up here. Uh, we have the tool library filled out um, the most for hardwood. So regardless of the type of wood you're using, uh, just click on the hardwood there. Um, and then we have all, almost all metric tools. We have a, a few imperial tools, mostly metric tools. So we're going to look at that selection. So as you're selecting here, uh, just double check that the tool you're looking to use is actually sitting in the tool holder over there. Um, otherwise it may be lost or broken. So I'm going to start with tool number 18, which is a two millimeter, two flute end mill. And so you can see the diameter of the tool at the end is two millimeters. It's got two flutes. It will do up to 0.4 millimeters per pass. And then uh, this is the spindle speed. So how fast uh, the machine is going to rotate the bit. And, and then the, the feed and plunge rate for this tool. And so you can see these, the combination of the spindle speed and these feeds, remember speeds and feeds, is what is going to generate this chip load. And so the chip load is basically the manufacturer gives us this number, and that's what we are targeting to, to uh, make sure that the, the um, bit is, can effectively cut, it doesn't overheat by going too slow, and it doesn't go too fast so that it might break. And so these settings should already be in there um, and should be somewhat, uh, somewhat good for the tooling we have. If you bring your own tool, you'll have to find out what the chip load should be, the target chip load, and then configure these parameters yourself. So let's say I wanted to do this entire pocket with this one tool, this tool 18, two mil end mil. Uh, it's gonna need three passes because remember I can only go 0.4 mil per pass. And so we're gonna do that. Um, there's some other settings here in terms of climbing versus conventional cutting. I'm gonna say, yes, I do wanna ramp the plunge move. So that means when I go into the material, it will bring it in on an angle. Uh, it's not strictly necessary, but it doesn't hurt. Um, I'm gonna give this a name. So the path that I'm cutting here, I'm just gonna give it my initials here, AS initials. That way it's a little bit more descriptive. So I'm gonna hit calculate. And so you can see 
these blue lines are all of the actual cutting paths. And then you can see these red lines are the rapids. So it's basically going to start here at the bottom left. It's going to move on to the material, go down, and it's going to cut these different letters out. And so I can do a preview of all the tool paths to see how this would look. And you can see that it's actually doing three passes to get to that required one millimeter depth. So I'm going to close the preview and I'm going to take a look at this little timer here. And this is going to be a summary of all the tool paths, including the estimated times. And so you can see here, as is using just this one small tool, I am looking at 34 minutes, 34, almost 35 minutes to um, cut this. So let me show you how we can uh, make that quite a bit faster. So I'm going to reopen my toolpath by double clicking on it. So one thing I can do to make this a bit faster is to get rid of one of the passes. So let's say I'm okay with going 0.8 millimeters deep instead. Um, so remember this tool only wants to go 0.4 per pass. So I'm getting rid of a third of the time right there. And then the other thing I can do is I can actually add another tool into the mix here. So I'm going to choose tool number 23, which is a six mil end mill. So this is a three times the width of the two mil. And so it's going to remove material a lot faster than the two mil. And it has four flutes, um, and so I'm going to select that. So now I have two tools selected here. I have tool 23, which is a 6 mil end mill, and tool 18, which is a 2 mil end mill. And so I'm going to ro rotate down here, and I'm going to calculate that. And so now you can see uh, the tool paths here. And so if I, if I just click on this thing, it'll, it, this little checkbox, it will hide all the tool paths, and I can show you them one at a time. So you can see with the six mil, I'm going to come in here and it removes a lot of material at a time. So it doesn't take a lot of motion to remove that much material. It can also do deeper passes than the smaller bits. Um, and then you can see I'm going to come back with the small bit just to get the corners and the edges and clean up the edges here. Um, and so that's going to be my two tool paths. So I can preview all the tool paths and you can see that the end result is going to be the same. Um, but let's go over to our timer, the summary estimated times, and we can see we went from 35 minutes, and now we're not going quite as deep as we were before, but you know, 0.2 mil less deep. Um, but the six mil tool pass is going to be uh, one and a half minutes, and it's got all the specs here, and then the two mil is going to be three minutes. And so we went from a 35 minute job to a roughly four and a half minute job much better, especially for just a little induction test here. So that's that. So I've, I've uh, gone from finding a piece of stock, measuring it, setting up a job in VCarve, entering text, generating the vectors for my text, entering, uh, selecting that, going in and generating pocket tool paths with multiple passes with different tools. Um, and that's all done. So I'm ready to basically save this off onto a USB stick and um, then do my cuts. So let's go ahead and insert a USB stick into the side of the CAD CAM PC and we should be good. And so now I'm going to, I've got a folder that I've already created on here. Um, and so let me close that. So up until now, everything that I've shown you could do on any PC using the free version of vCarve Pro. So we have the Makerspace licensed edition here uh, on the PC at the space. If you go into the help menu about vCarve Pro, display Makerspace ID, there is a license code here that you can use to put into the trial version of vCarve Pro. So you can basically work at home on the trial version with this code, bring it in. This is also on the tool page bring it in, uh, load your VCAR file in here, and then the only thing that you need to do in the space is do this save toolpath operation. So everything else, all the design, all the, tool, all the path generation I can do on, on any PC, uh, and then the only thing I need to do here in the space if I want to is save the toolpaths, or I can do it all in the space if I want to. So I want to make sure that I'm doing visible toolpaths to multiple files, um, and because I'll need to load the toolpaths individually. I want to make sure that the machine is set for the mini CNC, which is the ISIL CPM 2018. And the post processor should be the Linux CNC ARCs uh, tool name post processor. So I'm going to go ahead and say save toolpaths. And I'm going to find my USB drive here. 
and my folder here and I'm going to give this a more descriptive name uh, I'm going to call it AMS induction I have some old files here um, so I need to make sure I don't get confused uh, among those uh, but now that's all set and so now I can go ahead and safely eject my USB stick and then bring it over to the Linux CNC machine attached to the mini CNC and go ahead and start cutting my job. So turning on the mini CNC. So it's a three step process. First, switch on the power on the electrical outlet. Done. Then come over to the machine. Typically we left it in an e-stop state. Uh, that way you can move the bed around and clean up. Twist to the right. Just a, uh, about an eighth of a turn, uh, which is clockwise, so to the right, clockwise, to release the e-stop and bring it back into normal state, and then press the power button. Power button should turn green, should hear the fan come on. So now the CNC is, the machine itself is powered on. The next step is to turn on the PC, the Linux CNC PC that controls it, power button on the top left of the box. Make sure you do it in this order because you want this machine to come up so that when Linux CNC boots, it actually can see this machine and connect. Otherwise, you'll have problems later. So we'll give Linux a moment to start up. While we're waiting for Linux CNC to boot, we can go over here and tag our fob on tool control. Otherwise, we won't be able to use the machine. The username and the password for the machine is CNC. CNC. This is also on the tool page. Insert shot. To start Linux CNC, click on the penguin that's marked CPM 2018. You can then maximize the window by either double clicking on the top bar or pressing the small box here. So this, now you have Linux CNC started up. If you signed into tool control, you'll see that this power button here is activated. Otherwise it will be grayed out. And so this will let you then connect to the machine. So now I've powered on the mini CNC. I've powered on Linux CNC. I've opened up the program and I've pressed power here. That means I should be able to jog the machine around. So jogging the machine around is essentially manually moving it in whatever direction I want. So you can see I'm manually moving it here. So the first step that we want to do once we've powered everything on is, co is called homing. And so we want to click in the Linux CNC interface on the home all button. So this is very important because when it starts up, it has no idea where it is in 3D space. And so this will bring it to a known state, which is 000, the top left corner of the machine. And so that means it will reset the coordinates back to a certain state and it will know where, where everything is in 3D space. I said the same thing twice. Now that we're homed, we can see some, uh, some lines on, there, on the screen. This is where I've moved the machine around. If we wanna clean those up, we can press on this little brush here, which will then erase any uh, previous movements. So now I can show you jogging around and you can see the yellow movements are where I'm actually jogging. If you look closer in on the design here, this is just the default design. The white movements are where it's going to cut and then the, the rapids are these blue lines which is where it's going to just move from place to place before it actually cuts. In Linux CNC, you can move around by um, clicking, left clicking will move your, your viewpoint around. Using the scroll wheel will zoom in and out. And then holding the scroll wheel down will allow you to rotate your design in 3D space. There's also some pre-programmed viewpoints here, which are helpful. So you can do a complete top-down view by pressing the Z. You can do a side view by pressing X and Y and you can do just a uh, kind of a you know, 45 degree uh, profile view using the P. So once you've generated your G code on vCarve, then use a USB stick to transfer the file from the CAD CAM PC over to Linux CNC. And then what next thing you wanna do is open up the file manager here. 
which is a little file cabinet. You're going to bring it up. You're going to find your USB stick. I wish I had a USB stick. And then you're going to copy the file um, into a, your own user folder on the desktop of the machine. So create a folder with your username or your Discord's username, something unique. Um, this is just a temporary storage area, so don't don't use this as a backup, but then copy from the USB stick onto the machine. That way, if anything goes wrong with the USB stick, your design is, is saved locally. And then don't double-click on this, but what we want to do to actually open it is go into the File menu on Linux CNC, click Open, Browse to Home CNC, and then Desktop user files, your username, and then open up your design. So here's my design. And so now you can see uh, this would be ready to cut uh, once I load my stock and, and uh, touch off on the axis. So before you do your design, you need to know exactly what size stock you're gonna be using. So you wanna measure all three dimensions. So you wanna measure your, your X, so the length of it, you want to measure your Y, so the, the height of it, and then you want to measure the thickness, which is going to be your Z dimension. And so you have all three dimensions. You're going to use that in VCarve in order to actually um, design your, your, your piece. And so in this case, I've designed just my initials here. This will be the, uh, the kind of induction test, is designing your initials for a certain size stock and then loading the stock and actually cutting it. And we're gonna use two different end mills of different sizes in order to efficiently clear out as much area as possible and then come back in with a smaller end mill and clean and get the detail, the finer detail. So now we'll show you how to uh, load the stock in the machine. First step is to open the machine. The cover switch is a momentary switch. So I need to hold the cover switch, grab the door and open it up and then the shock should hold it open. Next step is to load your stock. And so you can take your, your stock, put it on the bed in the fixed jaw, and then you can slide the clamp over until it's firmly up against it and then tighten it down. And this tightening of, of it down should tighten not only the clamp down to the bed, but then also up against your stock. Next step is to verify that it's gonna be solid enough. So grab your stock with both hands and move it around and just not not super hard but hard enough to make sure that it's not going to come loose once you start running your job. So first step is to put the collet together as Kyle showed you. Click, insert the collet into the bottom of the spindle and turn it most of the way up until it stops. For my first cut I'm using a tool number 23 which is a six mil for flute to do the clearing. And so once I have this, the collet installed in this spindle, then I can insert my tool. The tool length should be up as far as possible without being on the flute cutting surfaces with as little stick out as possible. Now that I have the collet inserted and the tool inserted to the right length, I need to tighten the collet. There are two specific tools that you use to tighten the collet. One is a standard wrench and the other is a collet nut wrench. So I will go down and look at the flat sides of the spindle and hold the collet nut, uh, the, the standard wrench there. And then I will turn the collet nut with the collet nut wrench. So you want this to be medium tight. So kind of use a couple of fingers and, and push on it, but you don't want it over tightened. You also don't want it too loose. Otherwise the bit could come loose and that could ruin your entire design uh, or even break the bit. If it's too tight, the collet could get damaged and get stuck inside the spindle. Next step, now that I have my stock firmly mounted on the bed and I have my, my uh, end mill firmly mounted inside the spindle, is to double check the speed of the spindle is set correct for the G code that I'm about to run. So I've got a six mil four flute cutter, so I can go look in VCarve and find out what speed is expecting. Uh, it's expecting 19,000, so I can double check that the knob up here is, is set to the right speed. So that it's a manual speed control. Um, some uh, more high-end CNC's have, have uh, software speed control, but we don't have that. Um, so you have to manually make sure that that's correct. So now everything is all set inside of the machine, so I can now close the cover. 
and reactivate the machine in Linux CNC. So now that we've closed the cover, uh, the next step is to touch off. And remember, the first thing we did when we powered up the machine is, is home all. So home all means that it knows, the machine knows in 3D space where it is. What it doesn't know is how big your stock is, where the clamps are, and where your design is going to be. And so the next step is we want to touch off. Inside of VCarve, we've set a certain origin. Uh, it could be any corner or the middle of your workpiece. And so what you want to do is now tell Linux CNC and tell um, the mini CNC where your actual workpiece is. And so to do this, we're going to jog the machine, which again is manually moving it using the arrow keys uh, to move X and Y, to move up and down in the Z axis, use page up and page down. And so I'm going to manually go to the bottom left corner and the top of the piece, and that's where my origin is set. So first, you can touch off each axis independently. And so I'm going to first line up X and Y, and, and I'm going to leave Z a little bit off the top of the piece. But I can go down and look at it from a, the side here, and I can look at it from the side on the other axis. You want it right in the middle of the tool. And so now I have X and Y right on the corner, looking at it from the sides. And I'm going to go into the Linux CNC interface, um, click on the radio button that says X, do touch off, press OK. Click on the radio button that says Y, touch off, OK. And then what I like to do is bring it up a tiny bit, bring it onto the surface of the workpiece, and then to touch off the Z, go all the way down just very slowly, just till it touches, and then go in and click on the radio button and touch off the z-axis and so now you can see that our design is now inside the boundary box of the movement area of the machine which is good and we can then go validate that our design fits within the boundaries of the actual stock that we're using and so we haven't made a mistake and jog all the way over to the top uh, the top right corner so the opposite end of the design and just validate that in real life this design is going to fit on my workpiece and we're not going to go off we're not going to hit any clamps we're not going to um, go anywhere we don't want to go also validate that the depth is what you think it's supposed to be and so you can do that by looking at um, the x view here and you can see how deep into the wood it's going to go uh, by touching off on the top of the of the of the stock uh, that means that a negative number in the, in the z in, the, in Linux CNC is how deep it's going to cut into that wood. And so just verify that it, it's not going to hit anything, not going to hit any clamps, not going to hit any, not going to go through the stock into the bed before you run your job. So now we're ready to cut. We have our, we've touched off. We've got our stock mounted. We've got our, everything else set up correctly. Uh, there's two ways to actually start your job. One is the physical switch uh, button on the front that says start, and there's a stop button corresponding as well. Or you can use the play button inside of the Linux CNC uh, graphical user interface. Uh, before we actually start the job, we want to make sure that we're ready to hit the e-stop in case there's any problems. And then we also want to turn on the extraction. The Henry at the top has two switches. One is a green button, that's the power switch, and then there's also a turbo button. So make sure you hit the right one, just turn on the green button to turn on the, the extraction. And then we should be ready to go. So be ready with the e-stop, and then press the start button. VCarve will generate um, G-code that will ask you to insert the tool, which we've already done. So you can just press, uh, press the continue button, and then the machine will start. Be ready on the e-stop in case there's an error. So be ready to press that. So now we're watching our machine. You can look at the speeds and feeds, make sure that it looks like it's cutting efficiently, not too fast, not too slow. Too slow would be, uh, smoke would start to be generated. Too fast, we would hear the machine straining or the bit straining. So the whole time while I'm doing my first cuts, I, I'm on the e-stop, ready to stop the machine in case something goes wrong.
Okay, and everything looks good. Turn off the extraction and get ready for the tool change. Okay, you can see the red lines are where the machine has already cut. So remember originally it was white, now it's red. It's showing where the actual cut patterns were. Um, when we change tools, we wanna to make sure we load our next tool path. So I'm gonna load up. First I had run the clear path, which is uh, that says clear one at the end. The next one is gonna be the second path, which is gonna be the detail. So you can see now I have a fresh set of, of white paths here that haven't been cut yet. Um, and so those are loaded and I'm going to load uh, the next tool. So the next tool I have is a tool number 17, which is a much smaller. I can look at the tool chart to see what that is. It's a 2.5 uh, millimeter diameter tool end mill. And so I can open up first uh, before I open up the machine. So before I change tools, I want to make sure I can get the old tool out. And so I want to use page up to bring the tool off of the stock before I change it. Don't bring it all the way up to the top, but bring it most of the way up. And then again, hold the momentary switch for the cover, open the cover. Everything's disabled again when the machine is open and when it's um, not running. Okay, so use your wrench and your call it nut wrench to loosen it a couple times and then you can pull out your original tool. If your second tool has a different shank diameter, make sure you change the collet. In my case, I'm using uh, the same size. It's a six millimeter shank, much smaller um, mill end, um, but I can keep the same collet. And then again, put it in, keep it 100% on the shank, but make sure uh, you put it all the way up as far as you actually need so you have as little stick out as possible. And then tighten it up. Again, medium tight. Couple of fingers to push it, but not over tightening it. And so now the important bit here is that I'm gonna take it, I wanna make sure I don't touch the X and Y um, touch off point, because I want the design to be relative to the original design, but I need to retouch off on the Z axis. So re-enable the machine by pressing the soft power button on the GUI, and then you can jog the machine again. And so now I need to find a nice spot on the stock where I can touch off my, my second tool. So I'm gonna bring it down somewhere out of, the, out of the design and slowly touch off right on top of the stock. So remember, only touch off on the Z axis. Do not change the X and Y axis. If you do, it will be almost impossible to line it up perfectly with your original design. So now we can bring the end mill up and then we are ready to run our second path. So again, just double check that your path is covering uh, is in, entirely on the stock and that the depth is correct. We don't, again, we still don't want to make sure it doesn't hit any clamps, doesn't hit the bed. So I'm just going to double check that it goes to the extents and it looks good. Everything checks out. And so now I'm going to start uh, my second path. So again, turn on the extraction the green switch on Henry, press the start button, and get ready on the e-stop. Okay, now that my design is completely finished, I want to jog the machine up. That way I can re safely remove the bit before I clean up and, and um, put everything away. So jog up most of the way. Again, hold down the cover switch, open it up. 
use the wrenches to remove the bit. Remove the bit and then unscrew the collet. And so assuming we didn't over tighten the collet, it should come out again in two pieces together. Put those back where they go. Make sure you put the collet back in its correct uh, hole in the holder. Make sure you put the end mill back in the correct tool number slot for the next user. Remove your workpiece, and then you can go to the wood shop and clean that up with the sander. And then I want to turn Henry on again and disconnect the hose. Leave the connector on the uh, the uh, CNC machine. Disconnect the hose, and we can do a little bit of a cleanup here. So when, when the machine is actually completely e-stopped, that means all the steppers are powered down, I can manually move it. So you'll see how when I did that, all the machine, the, the, uh, the gravity of the Z-axis just made it, made it fall down. But I can actually manually move the axes around to finish my cleanup. And so you want to do this cleanup after you've taken your, your design out and after you've taken the bit out. Uh, the end mill out. Otherwise, you have the risk of hitting the, the bit with your hand as you're cleaning. So completely hoover all, all of the sawdust and leave the machine as clean as possible for the next user. Remove all the sawdust from the inside of the machine. Don't use the, uh, the hoover on the plexiglass as it can scratch it. Use the towel that's provided. And slide the bed around to make sure you get all of the debris from underneath. All done. Let's go through a couple of troubleshooting um, issues that, that sometimes happen. So after you're done with your job, if you manually move the bed all the way to one extent, that means it will be on what's called a limit switch. And so there's, there's switches, micro switches throughout the entire machine uh, that tell it when it gets the end of an axis. And so if it remains on the limit switch, the next time you power up the machine, uh, it will give you an error. And so if you see, if you see this error, then you want to make sure to actually come in and manually move it off of the limit switches and make sure it's somewhere in the movement area and not stuck on the limit switch. The other thing that can happen is there is a power switch directly located on the side of the spindle, this one. And if this one is turned off, then your spindle will not, will not turn on. So normally this is just always on because it's you know controlled by the machine in terms of turning it on and off. Uh, so make sure that if your spindle isn't turning on, that's something to check. When you're done with your job, you can leave the machine e-stopped, close the lid, and power off. Can you see that? Yeah. And power off on the outlet. And so the CNC machine itself is shut down. Next step is to shut down the Linux machine. In order to do that, we want to close Linux CNC. It will say, do you really want to close? Yes, I do. And then I want to make sure to safely shut it down. So we don't want to just power it off. But if you go up to the top right and click on CNC, which is your username, click shut down and say shut down. That will safely depower the Linux machine. Um, and then you can re remove your USB stick and everything is shut down and ready for the next user. So make sure all the collets are back where they go. All the end mills are back where they go and you've left the area uh, in a nice condition for the next user.